of us that were here last night were very, very fortunate to be mesmerized by some very strong presenters, eloquent, brilliant, and entertaining presenters. And tonight, we're going to give those of you here a glimpse of what we enjoyed last night. So I'm going to be calling on some, just two of them that are here as panel members to have a panel discussion, okay? And you could probably be mesmerized like we were last night. So I'm going to call on <laughs> Dr. Aya Ineli, or Tani Aya Ineli, and <laughs> Mr. Elvis. And both of them are going to, oh, please can you uh, go sit up there so at least people will see you very well in here. Please help me. Please, please, please. Thank you very much. And I'm going to be calling on the CEO of Black Pumps, none other than my CEO, Nani Wasike. She's going to be the mother. Come, baby. Welcome, like our beautiful, wonderful mistress of ceremony said, this is just a glimpse of what we had yesterday. We had and have two amazing speakers. Aya is a mother, she's an attorney, she's a wife, she's a life coach, a business coach, an entrepreneur, and an author. Actually, she has some of her books outside, so if you can please stop by and pick up a book, that would be awesome. So here is how this is going to go. Oh, my name is Noni Mwasike. I am from Black Pumps TV. Yay! <laughs> so I'm going to have them introduce themselves and just kind of like give us like a one minute or two minute uplifting speech because our theme this year is there to build your key to unlocking your success. So they're going to tell you how to live that extraordinary life in about two minutes each. And then we're going to, <laughs> yeah, it's capsule size. And then we're going to open it up for questions. So, and that's Elvis. Elvis is also an author. And he wrote a wonderful book, Rise to Your Best Self. So. Hook up with him and he'll give you that book. So these are the keys to your relationships, to income, to anything, to a better life. So without much, I'd let me take myself out of this picture and hand it over to Aya and Ellie. Okay, so women first. Well, good evening, everyone. It's really my pleasure to be here all the way from Texas. And I just want to honor our amazing hostess. And I have a little gift for you. Thank you for all that you do. I appreciate you so much um, and just giving me this break. Yes, I am a mother of five children, so anytime I get to travel, it's like vacation for me. <laughs> I haven't cooked or done any laundry today, so that's just really <laughs> awesome. Okay, so really quickly, um, how, do you, how do you condense 45 minutes into two minutes? I'm, I'm going to do it this way. I'm going to give a two-part message, one for men and one for women, and then I'll pull it all together. How about that? So the first thing I want to say to the men in the room, and I hope you record this and I hope you share this with your friends and with your sons and with your fathers, is that when I look at the condition of Nigeria, when I look at the condition of Africa, when I look at the condition of Africans, of people of African descent all over the world, and I know we have people who are not of African descent here, that's what actually is really all civilizations start in Africa, so we all have it to one extent or the other. But when I look at our condition, men, I want you to remember this. If we were to do an illustration, and I told you I have a briefcase over there with $100 million in it, and that there are two couples starting right here, and whoever gets there first gets the money. And in one case, you have a man who is holding down his wife, right? Because he doesn't want her to move. And on the other side, you have a couple who are okay walking hand in hand. 
Which couple do you think will get to the $100 million first? The one holding down his wife or the one going hand in hand? Absolutely. Because if you're holding someone down, guess what happens to you too? You can't go far either. And what I see happening in our society, and there's so many examples of this, is that for some reason, and it's almost embedded in our DNA now, but we are smart enough to take care of that. We have chosen rather to rise to our best as men to instead hold down our women to feel better about ourselves. And we need to start challenging it in all its forms, in all the insidious ways that it shows up in our lives. I can only give that little brief piece. Think about it. For the woman, I want to say this. Frederick Douglass said this many years ago. Power concedes nothing without a demand. And so as much as I'm a traditionalist, as much as I was raised in Nigeria and I love my culture, every tradition is not something you want to keep or carry on. And at some point, we have a responsibility to ask ourselves, to what extent are we complicit in our own victimization? And to what extent are we victimizing other women as well? So if we're ever going to live up to who we are on the inside, we have got to break these chains, the chains that cause us to hold other people down and the chains that cause us to stay in that position. And one of the keys to doing that, if I can, uh, there are five keys I gave yesterday, but if I pull it all together, it's really this, you are enough. It is only fear that causes us to feel like we have to compete all the time. Oh, your so dress is so fine, so I gotta sit in the corner, because I don't feel mine is so fine. What? Like you are magnificent, just as you are. And if we start to believe that we are enough, then I don't have to compete with my brother Elvis, because when he speaks and when he shares, I don't know how much you'll be able to share, when he shares his journey, you realize the greatness in him and you can celebrate it and I can celebrate it without being diminished by the fact that he has experienced and overcome things that I haven't. You are enough. And if you start thinking that you are enough, you're going to change how you do everything in your life and things will change in your life. Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to be here, really. And every time that I had to uh, speak in front of the group, I still feel that butterfly in, inside my stomach. Uh, simply because that's who I was many, many years ago. I am originally from Cameroon, and I've been here over a decade ago. I've been here a decade now. And just to stand here talking in front of you, it's been a tremendous, uh, accomplishment for me, not for anybody else. And the message that I said yesterday that I want to repeat today is simply that it's possible. It's possible to live an extraordinary life. Because as a little boy growing up in a small village of Cameroon, I could have not imagined in a million years that I could be doing what I'm doing today. Because I grew up in a very a poverty-stricken family and didn't have hope of the future. And when luck was on my side to help me go to school and come here, I was doing what everybody was doing. I was studying what, what everybody was studying, trying to think what everybody wanted me to think. Just like growing up, we were told by our parents, well-meaning parents, that this is the way we should do. Maybe this is the discipline we should learn in school, the type of friend that we should uh, associate ourselves with. So in a sense, uh, we stop becoming who we are as the purest baby that we come here on earth. So telling you that to live the extraordinary life, I put it in three steps. And for me, the first step is to decide. A simple, simple as that, it's very simple. It may not be easy. That's a very step to try to live the extraordinary life. 
a life of passion and purpose. No matter what your age, no matter what your circumstance, you can decide today because you are now a series of decisions you've made in the past. So you can start to make new decisions that will lead you to the place that you really want to feel fulfilled. And the next step is actually action. And I mentioned again yesterday that you can never hire somebody to do the push-ups for you. You've got to do it yourself. You've got to take action with the decision that you've made. Because without action, the dream would always remain the dream. Then when you take action, the, important is, the importance here is not just to push yourself doing it. You've got to feel pulled by your goal, by your dream. And you enjoy the journey as you go along. And then lastly, the last step, when we have decided about where we want to go in life, and we start taking action as to making that a reality, the last thing to do is to look next to you. If there's somebody that you can touch and change life, it's about contributing to the society. I mentioned again that we've come here and then we are utilizing the fruit of labor of those who came before us. Then I believe it is our turn, in the sense, to do things that would assure that those who will come after us would know that we were here. So that's a lot of contribution. As you make the decision to move towards your dream, to live a life of purpose and passion, and take action to do that, the end thing would be just to look back and see somebody who just a little bit step below you and help them up. And with that, it would be possible for you to live a life, an extraordinary life of passion and purpose. And thank you. Awesome, thank you so much. this microphone is working. So what I've heard is, you know, for you to live this extraordinary life of purpose, you have to have passion and you also have to act. And I remember yesterday, one of the key things Aya has in her speech was a button that says act now. So in other words, it doesn't matter what you're doing, whether you're trying to grow wealth, whether you're trying to grow relationships, whether you're trying to lose weight, because we did have some fitness coach as well, or whether you want to be healthy. Those are the same steps. So Aya, before I go out to the audience for questions, what are those five steps that you need? Okay. Um, I like your <laughs> Okay, so I, I, I'm not sure I'm gonna take them in the in exact order that I shared yesterday. But the first thing is to even ask yourself, you know, am I living my dream or am I living my frustrations? Like you really need to take an assessment of where you are. You need to decide what it is you want to go for. And most of us are kind of living our lives on automatic pilot and we're living our lives based on what other people are doing, like Elvis referred to, as opposed to really looking to see what are our passions, what is it that we were put on earth to do and having enough courage to go for it. I also talked about um, making sure that you, you examine yourself to figure out, do you have a growth mindset or a fixed mindset? And a growth mindset allows you to look at whatever you're dealing with in life and to say, what can I learn from this and how do I move forward with this? As opposed to, if you've experienced any failures, letting it hold you back. Because actually, failure is just a part of the learning process, if you will. There, there's no success without failing first. And I gave the example of having a baby, who, um, a to you know, a toddler who's starting to walk. And the first time they walk, they stand up to walk and they fall. What if that child said, okay, I've failed, so I'm only, I'm only going to scoot on my bottom for the rest of my life? That would be insane, wouldn't it? 
But what we do is we encourage that child and they keep trying and they keep trying and one day they're walking and the next time they're running. We do not see the fact that they fell a hundred times before they started walking as a failure. It's part of the process. And we need to give ourselves that same grace, if you will. And then I also talked about the power of now. The fact that so many of us are always putting our lives off. Let me just talk to women, right? When I get that man, when I have that perfect marriage, right? Then I'll start living. Then it's, oh, when I have children, oh, no, 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 when I have a boy, right? So then you keep having kids, even if it's killing you, so you can have a boy. And then and after having the children as well, that, you know, so it's like we never get going with our lives, really. We're always waiting for them. And it's when I lose weight, when I this, when I, you know, and it's really understanding the power of just taking action now. And that there's really, you, I shared this yesterday, you look in the dictionary, sorry, not in the dictionary, on the calendar, there's no someday, there's no one day. There's sun, it's Sunday through Monday, right? Um, and so, so, Monday through Sunday, rather. And so, really having that power to make that decision right now that I'm gonna take action. And then the other thing is just the company that you keep as well, making sure that you are surrounding yourself with people who are like-minded, people who are going to sharpen you, people who are going to help you go to that next level. Bottom line is, you are amazing. Each and every one of us is absolutely unique. We need to believe that and we need to start showing up in our lives in that way. Um, as opposed to choosing to be mediocre or being overly obsessed with what people are thinking about us. I shared this story, I think, with someone um, late last night. We were there till like midnight. Um, I, I, I went home one time and my grandmother was at home and I was crying and I said, you know, all these kids in school keep talking about me and it's not fair and I'm crying. And she said to me, why are you crying? And I said, it's not fair, you know, they're not being nice to me and so on and so forth. She was just like, listen, if you're ever doing something with your life, people are gonna talk about you. Come back and talk to me when they stop talking about you. That's when you should cry, carry yourself and get away from it, you know, that kind of thing. Like you don't have problems. So for those of us who are being held back because we're concerned about what other people's opinions are, silly. They will talk about you and they should talk about you, right? So. <laughs> So now you see how amazing it was yesterday. So um, before I go out again, so let me have Elvis tell us about rising to your best self briefly. A little story about why I wrote that book actually is I am, my first language is French. And even when I came here in this country, my friends, you to tell me this is what you should do. Maybe you should become a doctor. You should become a nurse. That's where, what everybody was doing. And I thought, is that all there is in the United States, the only job that there is? And as I, as I shared yesterday, that the seed that was planted in my mind was in my English class here at Santa Monica College. When my professor taught me that there's something amazing in my voice. And for somebody who never thought that I have something that I can share with other people, it was a seed that started to sprout. And I embarked on a journey of self-discovery. I wanted to know exactly who I was. And that was really engaging with people like I mentioned, who are progressive people, people who are thinking uh, ambitiously. And I was reading a lot, and I discovered there's so much in life. There's so much that we're not using. We have so much, even here in the United States, there, there's library everywhere, and they are free. And only 3% of the people have the library card. And that surprised me. And I watched the, when I started to get that knowledge, and I realized it's important for me, it's possible to always elevate to a, a higher self. No matter where you are, even if you're making billions of dollars, you can make two billion. And maybe you can help some people who don't have. No matter where you are situated in life, it's possible to become better, maybe better communicator in your household, to communicate well with your spouse and your children. You can become better communicator, better leader, 
to lead people well, not what we see in corporate um, uh, America. So we can always elevate ourselves because there is no roof at which we can say, I am enough, as Aya mentioned. I am enough. We can always become more. We can do more and we can have more. And that's what that, books, that book actually uh, entails, to rise to your best self. Thank you. So you are enough. No excuses, act now. Press that button and act now. So hopefully you'll come back next year and join us. It was like seven, eight hours, and it was amazing and very empowering. So right now, do, I'm going to go down and see if you have any questions for them, whether you were here yesterday or not. My name is Chike Weke. I'm the publisher of Life and Times magazine. And I'm a very good friend of Black Pumps. I was here five years ago when it started. I believe it's early in this room. Four years ago. Um, and I want to speak to what my good friend Denzelli's wife, I just said. Speaking to the power of dreams. Five years ago, we were in this room we could count the number of heads in this room. Tonight is a crowd, is a sold out crowd. We are looking for seats where to sit people. And it's going to get better. It's going to get stronger and better because of the power of dreams because you have to say you are, because you have to tie up your bootstraps, do the push-up by yourselves, and know that, look, nothing can stop you. And I can exactly relate to what you said about how you can overcome circumstances to live your dreams. I came to this country 21 years ago with nothing in my pocket, with the belief that with God, all things are possible. I was making $3.50 an hour washing dishes in an African restaurant. So I can relate to how Black Pumps did a turnaround and is the leading women group here in the United States, providing content, <laughs> elevating the blood of a black woman, and taking it to the next level. And not only has lost friends who didn't believe in what she was doing, there were all kinds of whispers, what exactly is she trying to do, elevating what black woman, what is that? What exactly is that? What is Nani Wasike trying to do? But you all gathered here today, witnesses to the fact that if you put your hands to the till, if you believe in yourself, if you believe in the power of your dreams, if your dreams do not scare you, you will get there. Thank you very much. Anyone else questions for the, our dynamic team? Oh, he's high chief again. Thank you. I think I'm entitled to one question at least. <laughs> yes, with one part. Um, I want to first of all thank the panelists for your contribution this evening. Um, my question goes specifically to Ayo. Um, I love what you're preaching. Don't hold back your wife. She's your partner, and both of you can get there faster than any one of them could get there. But I also want you to consider the fact that maybe on this side of the country, of the continent, you're preaching to the choir. And let's think of how we can take that message also back home. Maybe by asking Black Pump to host Black Pumps in Africa. And my question is, would you be willing to come to Africa and stand 
your crown and say everything you say tonight. Well, thank you very much for the question. For those of you who know me or follow me on Facebook, you know that the answer to that question is an unequivocal yes. That's um, right. I, I, I welcome the opportunity to speak to my brothers all over the world, wherever they are and whatever positions they may have. Let me respond to you in this way. I don't think it's an either or, because as much as there has been progress with us here in the diaspora, there is still a lot going on in our homes. There's still a lot going on with our daughters. There's still a lot of, um, there's still a mindset that women are inferior that plays out even here in the United States. The way men talk, the way men treat women, the way they the way they interact with them. So although we have a lot of work to do at home, and I'm more than willing to go, and actually was just in Nigeria three weeks ago, and I did speak in Nigeria, I spoke in Lagos, there's still work that needs to be done here. As a matter of fact, when I was in Lagos, I counseled a young girl who is 14 years old and was a servant in a well-to-do home. Their son came back from America to visit and decided that it was within his power to rape her. He lives in America. He came back to Nigeria and saw a servant in, his, in, in their home and he raped her. She ended up getting, um, getting pregnant and the family paid for her to have an abortion and hushed her up. She happened to come to the presentation I was giving and just what we talked about just caused her to start sharing what she was going through. No counseling, nothing. So what I'm saying is absolutely I will share this message wherever God gives me a platform to share it. But men right here in America, your work isn't done by a long shot. <laughs> Okay, we have room for one more question. Okay, it's going to my friend, sister-in-law, Ifoma Adams from all the way from the area. Thank you for coming, darling. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm not sure it's, a, it's really a question, but as we pursue the equality of women, I think the emphasis needs to be on economic equality. Because without economic equality, you can never be equal. You cannot expect the man to be the one that steps out every day and handles everything and gets abused daily and then they come back in the house and they have someone to try to tell them we're equal. You cannot expect the man to handle all the problems they have to handle every day and then you come back and say we're equal. So when you stand up and you are on your own two feet, handling your own self and doing your own stuff, then you can say you're equal. I'm not saying that the men should abuse women or anything, but cultures change. The US, the Nigerian men, is not that much different from the American man. So if you, it's not just the Nigerian man, it's, it's the man. And it is the role that nature has placed in me. I am an equal partner in my marriage, that is because of my economical struggle. And that is the only way I personally believe that women will come out from where they are. And that is what Black Forms here is about, by empowering women to step out into the world and be who they can be. Okay, so that was our last question, so. I didn't have a question before, but after she spoke, I don't know if this is a question or not, but how do you define economic equality? If a woman stays home with five children from 6 a.m. to 11 p.m., how do you quantify that economically? If the man goes to work, maybe by 7 a.m., comes back by 5 a.m., and 5 p.m., food is ready, house is clean, the kids have done their homework, they've gone to all their activities, 
They are getting ready to go to bed. She puts the kids to bed, gives the man food. He goes to bed. He stays, cleans up, and gets ready for the next day. How do you quantify that? You cannot make it. Enough. 